Welcome to the 139th camp meeting of the Seventh-day Adventist Church in the Central California Conference. I'm here at the SoCal Conference Center near Santa Cruz, California, and our theme this year is Looking Up, and our focus is prayer. In just a few moments, we will hear an inspirational message from our speaker, Dr. Wesley Knight, Assistant Professor of Preaching and Ministry at Oakwood University. So we invite you now to join us as we open our hearts and let the Holy Spirit speak. Prayer connects us to the Almighty God. Prayer is the opening of the heart to God as to a friend. Prayer gives power, faith, and hope into the hands of the one who can move mountains. From the beginning of time, we have been looking up to a sky filled with mysteries among the stars. But the greatest mystery that has ever been revealed is that the maker of the universe would die to hear us forever. When we pray, we are talking to the God who loves us and desires the best for us. You are not talking to a void. You are talking to a boundless person who loves you more than eternity can reveal. Sokel is a camp of open dialogue between God and his people as we learn of his way through the scriptures and every moment of our day. Sokel Camp Meeting has become a timeless tradition of faith intersecting with culture pleasure bursting with praise, and truth uniting with tradition. It is camp meeting time once again. We invite you to join us as we worship our Creator together and let our prayer rise with the beauty of grace moving the soul. Good evening. Happy Sabbath, everyone. What a blessing it is to be here worshiping our Lord and Savior. We welcome you. This is SoCal Camp Meeting 2019, and we're so glad that you're back for our evening program. To those that are our streaming audience, we also like to extend a very special welcome to each one of you. We're going to start with a word of prayer, and I have this young, handsome man who's going to be praying for us this evening. And, uh, but before he does that, I'd like for you to meet him. So what is your name? Daniel. Abisai. Do you know what your name means? The... His name means the gift of God. Amen. Now you know that. And you are a gift to us this evening because you will be praying for our evening program. Uh, Abisai, tell us a little bit. What are you liking about camp meeting? The class we, we have, like, um, like the stuff we do, like art and making new friends, the teachers. And he can go on and on because he's made a lot of friends too and he's very grateful for the teachers that he has. So where do you live, Abisai? San Lorenzo. Okay, and how old are you? Nine. Nine, wonderful. We're so grateful and thankful that you chose to volunteer and pray for us this evening. So why don't you just do that right now? Let us pray. Dear Jesus, thank you for this day. Thank you for the Sabbath you've given us and that of the, of the, the week that just passed and of SoCal. Um, bless the pastors and their families, their ministries. Give them wisdom to preach your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise God for our children.
Amen. Amen. We know that we can hear the worship and we can also worship when we join our voices together and we know that God is with us. Standing on the promises of Christ, my King. He is our King. He is our Savior. Let's all sing together this wonderful hymn, Standing on the Promises of Christ, my King. Standing on the promises of Christ, my King. Through eternal ages, let His praises sing. Glory in the highest, I will shout and sing. Promises I cannot fall. Listen every moment to the Spirit's call. Resting in my Savior as my all in all. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing. Standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing. Hopefully you've gotten to meet these guys a little bit, but what we want to do is for those that weren't here at the beginning is to reintroduce them to SoCal Camp Meeting. And so led by Sergio Leva there on the piano, we're just so grateful coming to us from Riverside along with his sister, Susanna, over on this side. And get this, she's married to Julian. They're on the keyboards. And get this, they're on their honeymoon. They're on their honeymoon just now. Praise the Lord. We have here Isie, who is married to Dinar, and they are music ministers that come to us all the way from Orlando, Florida, at the Forest City Church. So we are glad to have them. Welcome them as a SoCal Camp Meeting Praise Team, and give them that SoCal warm welcome. God bless. Let's continue praising the Lord. Amen. We praise the Lord, and we give thanks for all the things that he's done for us and it's been a wonderful week we had a wonderful experience we enjoy praising and worshiping with you and we hope that we can be together again and we just give thanks to the lord with a grateful heart for all the blessings that he's given us let's all sing together give thanks let's give thanks give thanks with a grateful heart give
and side by side we stand waiting on God's command side by side with Jesus let's all stay together side by side until we meet our Savior Jesus Christ let's sing this wonderful song together side by side we stand side by side we stand waiting God's command worship Praise God for that music. You know what's music to God's ears? It's when we witness and we tell other people about it, amen? So let me tell you a story. Recently, there was a young college student named Sharonette. We'll call her Sharonette. And Sharonette liked to go to her public college campus and distribute literature everywhere. Well, one morning, she decided to go to class extra early. She went there, she put tracks on every single desk in the classroom, including the professor's desk, and it was one kind of tract. Then she sat back and she watched as the students and the professor came in. The professor came in, he picked up the tract off of his desk, and he said to the students, you all see this tract? I've seen this thing everywhere on campus. And then he said, open it up. They read the first two pages of it, and then the professor went to the board and he wrote down the title of the topic that morning that he was gonna teach, which nobody knew until he wrote it. The topic was relativism, and guess which tract she happened to pass out that morning? a glow tract on relativism. Amen? Amen? Praise God. That was a divine appointment, and God has many lined up for us, too. Thank you, Nelson. He talks really fast and has all these wonderful stories. And it's about evangelism. That's what, that's what we're here about, about spreading the gospel to the world. Amen? Amen? And it's my privilege tonight to announce the total as of this evening. It's 155000 $785.24. Ring that bell. Praise God. Thank you for everything you all are doing. Blessings. Good evening, church. How are you? Excellent. It's Friday night. It's almost Sabbath. Yay. All right. How many of you have ever called the office of the glow, the glow office at the conference office. Raise your hands. I see a few. Excellent. When you call that office, you get the sweetest voice in all of California, Desiree Albertson. And she is Glow's administrative assistant. And while she could do many other types of, of careers, she loves her job because it involves prayer. Can I hear an amen? Amen. Well, this week we have been talking about different kinds of prayers. We've even had our res Relentless Surrender segment that has talked about prayers that seemingly 
go unanswered. And we know they're answered, but sometimes it seems like they're not answered. We've talked about people who have terminal illnesses that are not seemingly healed. We've talked about people that are praying for spouses that never seem to come to church or they come years and years later. And while we know that these are spiritual giants and that God is answering in many ways, and that is a journey, we also know that God sometimes just puts a cherry on top. And sometimes he takes care of the tiniest, tiniest details. It's almost like God is romancing us. And Desiree has such a story. Desiree, can you tell us what you were praying for last Christmas? Yes. Well, last Christmas, the ABC, one of my favorite shopping stores, I hope it is for you as well, um, they had their open house for Christmas. And I thought, it's the perfect place to go to buy my Christmas presents. What a better way than to buy something that will serve for eternity. And you wanted the Joe Wheeler Christmas in My Heart yes. series. And he's got like 22, 23, 24, 25, 25 of those. And she wanted to get all of the set. Yes. They had those as a gift. And um, so with the drawing, I wanted to get it because my mother had always wanted those books, but never did get them. She did, one person gave them to her for a gift. And so, as I usually do with anything, I felt inclined that I really needed to pray. And so, as the time went on and they were doing the drawing, I prayed and I said, Heavenly Father, I just would love to get these for my mother for Christmas. If it be according to your will, would you please let me get those? But if not, if someone else should have them, please let them have them. So you prayed that morning. You went to the ABC. Yes. She stayed there all day. Yes. Witnessed <laughs> everybody in line. Yes. Prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed. And would you know it, and this is her prayer room that she had been praying in. She's got a special way that she prays and things around her to remind her of prayer. She went that day, and all of a sudden, they called my name. And so I, I won for my mother, and it was such a blessing. And she was so excited, but when she opened it, she was stunned. And she was, how did, how did you know that I always wanted those? And so I just want to share with you that prayer is the key and the hand of faith. And sometimes God actually gives us a Christmas present. Now, I want to remind you after sundown to support your local ABC. And Trevor has been generous and placed under five chairs gift certificates to the ABC. So you can look, and there's five, five gift certificates under your chairs. But God really can put a cherry on top and hear even our Christmas list, right? Yes. All right. <laughs> Good evening. I have with me Ricky Camacho, and Ricky works for the Central California Conference in the Literature Ministries Department and also with GLOW. And Ricky, you come from a big family. You have uh, a lot of siblings. There's yeah. six of you total. That's correct. And a number of years ago, a major crisis uh, hit you and your family. Give us a, a little snapshot of what took place. Yeah, so about six years uh, So your mom ended up on dialysis. Now, uh, it was for six years that she had this, and normally people don't uh, survive. That yeah, she, it was a very difficult situation. In fact, she actually saw many people pass away next to her uh, during, in the clinic. I see. Yeah. And, and while she is going through this, within a, a year of experiencing this, another major crisis hit the family. 
Yeah, during this time, about a year into my mom being on dialysis, my father actually passed away unexpectedly. And my dad was just like the cornerstone of our family of faith. And he, he died unexpectedly on January 1st. Now, before he passed away, uh, where was your own personal faith in Jesus? Before my father passed away, I wasn't really interested in the things of God. After he passed away, uh, that's when I actually started reading my Bible. And I started reading his Bible, and it gave me so much hope. I read his books, and I would see his underlining, and it made me um, want to see him more and see the reality of heaven more and, and see him again when Jesus returns. And you ended up uh, here at camp meeting mm -hmm. and ended up rededicating or dedicating your life uh, to God. Yes. And at that time, you also uh, got exposed to the literature ministries uh, department and uh, found out about Youth Rush and ended up going out for a summer and selling books. Yeah, I went to Youth Rush. I heard of it. I came to camp meeting, had a powerful experience, and I went to Youth Rush, and I witnessed miracles on a daily basis. It was powerful. And my mom was sick at this point still. She was still on dialysis, and God had called me. Like, he made it very clear that I should go to Souls West, which is the Pacific Union Conference School of Evangelism. Yeah, your intention was to go to Pacific Union College, but God is calling you to Souls West. Uh, so you get to Souls West, and you absolutely love it. No, I actually hate it. I didn't want to go. I wanted to go to PUC and study film production, but God called me and he made it very clear, you need to go there and I have a reason for you there. And you're there, you're miserable. Mm -hmm. uh, you want to leave and come home. Your family is telling you, look, come home uh, because mom is gonna pass away and once that happens, then go back. And, That's you know. right. My mom's health was going down and uh, at this point she was about to pass away and that first week, my sister, one of my sisters calls me and tells me, you know, mom is not doing very well. She's, she's about to die in a few months. Um, and it's better for you to just come back home. And then after she passes away, then we can, you can go and do whatever you want to do. So you end up deciding to, to go into the wilderness like Jesus, into the desert. And you fasted uh, for three days. Yeah. And you're up there just praying, pouring your heart out to God. And what does God tell you to do? And then what happened when you came down the mountain? So I wanted to leave, but I made, uh, God told me I need to be there, right? So I wanted to leave, and I prayed. I prayed for three days, and God responded by saying, just trust me. Just Did you trust like me. that answer? No, I didn't. In fact, after I came down from the mountain, I, I told my teacher that I was going to leave. So I packed all my things into my car, and I was about to leave. And then one of your friends prayed with you, and you, were, and you ended up just breaking down. And what did you decide to do? Yes, after more prayer and thinking about it, I, I broke down and said, you know, God, I don't understand this, but I need to trust you. I don't understand why you brought me to this school, and my, knowing that my mom is back home about to die, but I need to trust you. And so you, you began to trust God. Uh, you called your mom also mm -hmm. and told her you were going to stay. And interestingly enough, something came out of your mouth that was unexpected to you, but you told your mom that she was going to have a kidney by when? In December. I called her, and it just came out of my mouth. I don't know how, but it just came out of my mouth. <laughs> so you're prophesying. Mom feels a great calm, though, and she feels at peace. Uh, so long story very short, uh, she uh, is still in that condition. You're at school, and you end up at a Vespers in November, and that same teacher you met coming down the mountain comes to you, and what does she tell you? This teacher comes to me at, at, at Vespers and basically says, um, everything's set. Everything's ready to go. And I'm like, oh, yeah, the Vespers is set, right? And, but no, she, was, she said the surgery is set. I'm like, surgery? What are you talking about? So your mom ended up having surgery in December on December 10th. That's right. According she, to what you had said to her on the phone. That's right. And she feels amazing. She begins to respond immediately. You said her color began to, to change mm -hmm. uh, right away. But I know you're wondering uh, a little bit about the backstory about why the teacher knew before you that your mom was having surgery on December 10. So give us a, uh, an idea of how that happened. Sure. Basically, when I was coming down the mountain, I had told her that my mom needed a kidney and that all of us were not, none of us were compatible. Whenever we tried to see if uh, our blood was compatible, her antibodies were so high that the doctors actually told us that she'll never get a kidney. They actually told us that. And long story short, this teacher went uh, behind our back and she would fly from Phoenix to, to San Francisco and she got checked to see if she was compatible. And so the teacher ended up giving your mom her kidney and right. 
you, a doctor actually thought you guys were paying the teacher to do that. Yes, and they, they, didn't believe, they didn't believe that someone would do that for someone else. And so your mom is doing wonderfully today. As a matter of fact, Eva Camacho, we, she is here tonight. Let's go ahead and bring her on out. <laughs> and as we, as we close, Eva, what would you like to say about what God has done for you? Thank you, God, for answering my prayer. Thank you for Amy, Nance, for giving me the kidney. Thank Amen. Thank you. The first class that we had, club meeting that we had, one student showed up. The second club meeting, no one showed up. It was just us. But we just hung in there. We didn't give up. And after about a year, and actually we've been there for five years. This is our fifth year for the last four years. It's been the largest club on campus. We actually study the Bible. We actually study uh, New King James with the students. And uh, you know, the kids are voting with their feet because uh, once again at McLean, we're the largest club for the fourth straight year. Now that we're at Edison, uh, we, we've only been here for, this is like our fourth meeting that we had today. We started off with 24, which is really amazing. Most clubs on campus, um, if you have, you know, if you have 10 to 15 students, that's a pretty good size. You know, if you get up to the 20s, you're, you're, you're pretty, you're, that's a pretty substantial club. Well, our first uh, meeting here at Edison, we had 24 students, but maybe that was just beginner's luck. The next week, we had 24 again. The week after that, we had 28, and today we had 33 students. So the word is getting around. In fact, we're not even advertising. So we've really been urging, you know, Lord, please show us. And I say probably about three months ago, uh, two or three months ago, the Lord just impressed me. I mean, very strongly, very strongly. We don't have a lot of time. Uh, you need to go and open up other schools. Open, open, up, open up Adventist clubs in other schools. And we have about five or six other schools that we're working on right now to open up. And it looks positive, you know, the Lord is, the Lord is working miracle. The name of our organization is, um, we're calling them the Bread of Life Clubs. What this, what this club needs more than anything are some serious prayer warriors who are willing to um, make that one of the objects of their, their time with God. Pray specifically that we get volunteers. Now, I've heard this from uh, other church members that have visited, uh, their expectation was that basically the kids are just coming for the pizza. But what surprises people is when they show up, they discover that the kids are really paying attention, they're not looking at their cell phones, they're not talking to each other. We actually have them reading the Bible. Uh, they're, reading, they're reading the Bible, they're asking questions. They, in fact, they're, here at Edison, they're actually driving the agenda. We started off talking about knowing the ark, and so they had never heard about clean and unclean animals. Well, they wanted to hear about, they want us to talk about that. So today we talked about clean and unclean animals. Uh, we're launching into this whole uh, health thing. Uh, the class that we're meeting in is a science math class. And the kids really, they really have a desire to know if the Bible and science are clashing with each other. And they're, and they're surprised to find out that there's good science in the Word of God. But the thing that has surprised me the most over and over and over again is how much these kids enjoy opening the Bible on a public school campus and actually reading it. That just amazes me. Because I wouldn't think that. You know, they're, they're into all this music and you know, movies and videos. And I wouldn't think the Bible would be all that exciting, but it is. But you know, if we just reach some, that's good enough. It's worth all the money that we're spending for pizza and, and turkeys at, at uh, Thanksgiving and uh, you know, all the other extra things that we do for the kids. It's worth it. If we, if we just get one or two kids, you know, it's well worth it. Pray the Lord. You know, we have a wonderful educational system in this church and in Central we have about 1850 students enrolled in our schools and what a blessing it is. But the reality is that a great number of our young people are actually attending public schools and in particular public high schools. This is Mike Carter. Hello. 
And uh, who do we have here? Uh, Mike? This is my wife, Doreen, and, and this is my sister, Cherry. Very good. And, and they're both well, <laughs> they're great supporters of this ministry. Yes, they are. And I have mm -hmm. to say and begin by asking, what, what do you attribute this great movement that we are seeing in public high schools in the Fresno area? Well, this movement started with prayer. Pastor Bernardo, he prayed for two years. And uh, what we're, the reason why it's growing, why we're having this phenomenal growth is that my wife and I, we have this practice. We set our alarm clocks every hour. And we call each other and we just pray for the Holy Spirit. And we cannot keep up with the Holy Spirit. At so this you've point. been looking up. We've been hooking up, right. Amen, mm. amen, amen. Actually, this is one of those ministries where you're not mm -hmm. pushing anyone. You're actually trying to catch up with God. Yes. Because the Lord is going mm -hmm. 100 miles an hour. Mm. We're trying to catch up with yes. him. Uh, Mike, you, you started in the high school of? McLean High now, School. Now, for how many years? We've been there for five years. Five years. Don't want to brag, but for the last four years, we, we've been the largest club on campus. Yes, I just heard that. Mm -hmm. Isn't that wonderful? Mm -hmm. Amen. And on the video, um, actually, that was uh, Edison High School. Yes, that was Edison. And right. that's the latest one. Yes. And currently, you have about how many students we attending? We have about 34 students that are attending there. And there's no advertisement. Right. It's word of mouth. Yes. And uh, as you can see, they feed them with pizza, but they mm -hmm. actually don't go for pizza. No. No, they, well, they, you know, it takes a little honey to attract the bees. Sure, sure. Right? But um, we, we've actually, the, 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 the pizza attracts them, but they stay for the word of God. And that's something that the students have told me themselves. Amen. Actually, yes. I just met someone mm -hmm. a little while ago. His name is? Nafi. Nafi. Mm -hmm. He is now at Fresno State. Mm -hmm. They call you what? Uncle Mike. They call him Uncle Mike. And he's already going to Fresno State, and he was sharing with me uh, things like, I want to be with God. I want to learn about God. Mm. I went for the pizza, but I wanted the spiritual and mental blessings. Mm. We want to be involved with God. Amen. And now he's talking about, you know, he misses McLean. He graduated. But now he's asking about how can we start a club there mm. at Fresno State. Amen. Wow. Amen. Praise, Praise the Lord. God. Now, mm -hmm. as I say that God is, is running with this mm. thing, we're just playing catch up with him. I understand that there is how many other high schools that are asking for this? There are eight additional high schools so far uh, for the upcoming school year that have invited us on their campus so that we can start clubs there. So that's a yes. total of how many? Do Ten. the math. Ten. Ten. Yes. I like to. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. I, I want to just mention them because mm -hmm. they, those high schools have names on them. Madera South, Yosemite High, Roosevelt, Hoover, Clovis High, Sunnyside, Central East, Buchanan, B Bullard High. And there's a bunch of yes. un underlined with no names on it because mm -hmm. I think the Lord wants to fill those in too. Yes. And so what is the biggest problem that, or challenge I should say? Not a problem, but a challenge. The biggest challenge that we have right now, first of all, we need some serious prayer warriors, of course. And Amen. we also need volunteers for this. What do we need? Volunteers. Yes. And what do you think is funding this whole thing? Well... <laughs> The evangelism f offering, of course. Amen, amen. So you are part <laughs> yes. of this ministry. Mm -hmm. And in the a few seconds that I have left, some of these students we have had now, how many baptisms? Six baptisms. Where so do far. you take them? We take them to Team Bible Academy. We take them to Soquel. We take them to iShare. I... We take them to Sequoia Lake. We take them to prayer conferences. And you take them to, high, uh, to Soquel camp mm -hmm. meeting. Yes. And would you believe that this young man that I just met, who is not currently a baptized member, right. he actually funded a, an evangelistic series at the Exeter Church. Yes. These young people are actually preaching. Yes. So this is also a discipleship ministry. Mm -hmm. Thank you. God Thank bless you. Thank you very you. much. God Thank bless you. you for that evangelism offering. It's amazing what God can do when we give him our lives, when we give him our, our treasure, actually his treasure, our resources, his resources. We have an opportunity to once again to um, place before him the evangelism offering. 
you'll see an, uh, an offering envelope. If you don't have it tonight, there'll be some tomorrow. And we ask that you would prayerfully um, go through this and then ask the Lord, Lord, what is it you would like me to give so that you can use me and the funds that, that I'm returning to you? Let's pray. Oh God, our Heavenly Father, you have blessed so much. You have blessed us so much. So we want to give to you and we want to pray that you would bless the evangelism offering here this season. In Jesus' name, amen. Ushers, would you please stand and receive the offering? Thank you. Well, that was beautiful. Good evening and welcome to SoCal Camp Meeting. 
It's a Friday night here at Soquel, and we're just about ready to usher in the Sabbath. It's kind of misty outside and kind of cool, and it feels kind of nice just to come in here and, and begin singing. We've already heard a lot of uh, prayer testimonies, some songs, and it's already just been a beautiful, magical evening so far. David, who's up tonight for preaching? So this evening, uh, we have Dr. Wesley Knight. Now, as we mentioned, he's uh, filling in for Sean Boonstra. And so we're excited to have Wesley here. Now, he is not new to the Central California Conference. No, He's spoken no, no. here before. He's done a few trainings for, for pastors, uh -huh. uh, but he is new to camp meeting. Uh -huh. So this is his first time on the SoCal campus. And so uh, we're excited to have him here. Why don't you give us a, a, an overview of what we can expect or what kind of sure, uh, pastor sure. Dr. Well, Wesley I'm Knight told is. that he speaks a lot about prayer and that he's very theological sound and he is exciting to listen to as well. He also likes to speak about relational issues and he likes to speak to youth a lot. Uh, it sounds like his credentials are, are pretty significant. He has a doctoral degree from a Cormac uh, Theological Seminary in Chicago, Illinois. Additionally, he has been inducted as of April 2012 into the prestigious Martin Luther King Board of Preachers and Scholars at Morehouse University. So a heavyweight intellectual as well. Yeah, so it's going to be awesome to listen to uh, Dr. Knight this evening. So we uh, encourage you to continue to pray for Sean Boonstra and also pray for Dr. Knight and pray for this last last leg of camp. Last this leg, is, last weekend. Yeah, so it's going to be yes. uh, exciting. It's going to be a spiritual feast uh, and very powerful. So we're going to send you back into the main auditorium now for a special video about prayer. Yes. The Greeley Hill Adventist Church, about a year and a half ago, decided we were going to dedicate a classroom that was no longer being used for prayer ministry. And uh, so we began, we completely rehabbed the room and, and it became a real place of gathering to pray. And about the same time that was happening, I had been praying, Lord, help me to learn how to engage more with my neighbors. And um, the Lord helped me with that because one of my neighbors, 70 year old man, uh, has been substance abusing his whole life, was a Vietnam vet, came back from Vietnam with heavy substance abuse and, and never really came out of that completely. And he came and asked me, he said, the doctor told me I need to wash my feet morning and evening and, um, and uh, put some ointment on them and I can't reach over and, and reach my feet. Would you be willing to help me? Actually asked if my girls could come wash his feet. And I said, well, no, Ron, um, but I, I'll help you. I'll do that. And that turned into about a year where uh, after a while, even my wife became engaged and we provided Ron with food and helped keep his house clean, helped him take showers. I even got calls at one in the morning because he used suspenders and he'd, and he'd go to the bathroom and, he, and his pants would fall down around his feet and then he couldn't reach down to pick them up. So he'd call me at one in the morning, I'd jump out of bed, drive over and uh, help Ron get his pants back up. One night he had a major uh, bleed where if we hadn't been able to come and help him, he would have bled out. Uh, and uh, so we are involved with Ron's life in all kinds of ways. But the beautiful thing is after I'd worked with him for several months helping him, he, um, he said to me one day, he said, you know, Rob, I've been thinking. He said, uh, the only friends I have left are the Christian friends. All my other friends have just, they, they don't want to be with me anymore. And then a few weeks after that, he said, you know, I've been thinking, I haven't been in a church since I was 13, and I think I want to come back to church. So Ron came to church. We picked him up every week. The last uh, six, eight months of his life, he was in church every Sabbath. And um, partway through that time, we had been gone for a Sabbath, and he called us up on the phone. He must have left five or six messages on our machine before we got home late uh, Sabbath evening. And he, he wanted to tell us, I'm with God now. God had, had touched his heart in the service that day, and uh, there was certain things that really weighed heavily on him, a lot of anger towards his family and, and anger towards God. And he felt that was completely resolved in his life. And he said, I'm, I'm with God now, I'm with God now. And it was 
was so excited to tell us that. He died last March, um, but we were felt real privileged. We felt God taught us just as much as he was teaching Ron about loving and caring and serving another person. And uh, we're, our hope is that, uh, you know, we can't read hearts, but it certainly seemed like God was doing a real work in, in Ron's heart. And we're very hopeful that we'll see him in heaven. Tonight is a special night because the Sabbath is upon us. And what else is special tonight, Pastor Kinney? Well, Flora, it's special because tonight at 9 p.m. we have an anointing service in the Esperanza room. How many of you believe in the power of God? And how many of you tonight have experienced a miracle in your life because of God's power? Uh, last November, I was diagnosed as having an enlarged heart. And um, I was just so scared. The medication that I was placed on was making me sicker than I've ever been. And I called some wonderful friends that I know who love me and care about me, people that I knew that were close to God, and I asked them to please pray. And in March, I went back to the cardiologist. He gave me a barrage of tests. I thought I was going to die. But then he called me back about 10 days, and he said to me, you know what? Don't worry about anything. You do not have an enlarged heart. Everything Amen. is working fine. You're going to live for a long time. I hope that's true. But anyway, you know, tonight we are here to pray, and we want to invite you to the Esperanza room at 9 p.m. to experience a miracle from God. Amen. Let us pray. Amazing God, you're so awesome. We want to thank you and praise you for what you've done in these campgrounds and in our lives. Father, I ask that you fill us with your Holy Spirit. May you continue to guide us until you come. And fill us with your presence, I pray. Amen. Holy Spirit, come near us tonight. Fill us tonight, Lord. May you just, may tonight, Lord, may we have a storm tonight. Amen. May we have rain tonight, rain, your Holy Spirit just raining down on your people here tonight. Lord, I pray to God in a very special way for our speaker, Dr. Knight. I pray to God that you will just fill him with power from on high. Lord, as he proclaims your word, may Christ Jesus be seen and heard. And I pray tonight, dear God, that each one of us would not leave this place without having an encounter with you. I pray, dear God, that your Holy Spirit will touch all our hearts. Lord, that you will draw us near and close to you. Lord, tonight I pray for the evangelism offering. Lord, you have all the money that you need. There is only one problem. It's in our pockets. And I pray, Lord, that you will take away our selfishness, Lord, so that we can give liberally, we can give generously, always remembering that we can never beat God's giving. Amen. The more we give, the more he gives back to us. Lord, we praise you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. We praise him, we thank him for all the blessings. He is exalted, the king is exalted on high. Let's all worship our king. Exalted, the King is exalted on high. I will praise Him. He is exalted forever, exalted in God. We'll praise His name. He is the Lord forever. His truth shall reign. Exalted, the King is exalted on high. I will praise Him. He is exalted forever, exalted and I will praise His name. He is the Lord, forever His truth shall reign.
exalted, the King is exalted on high. exalted we exalt our king we worship our king and we pray today draw me close to you and never never let me go he will never let us go let's stay close to Jesus draw me close to you draw me close to you that's our prayer let's sing it draw me close to you Never let me go I lay it all down again To hear you say that I'm your friend You are my desire You are my desire will do cause nothing else can take your place to feel the warmth of your embrace Lord help me find the way help me find the way bring me back to you
Let's praise Him. Let's worship Him. This is the time that we have to worship together as a family. We all need Jesus in our lives. We need Jesus in this world. We need Jesus in our church. We need Jesus in our family. That's why we have to lift up our eyes to Him, to our leader, Jesus Christ. Let's all stand as we sing our theme song that we've been singing throughout this week. It's a beautiful song. It's our prayer. We will lift up our eyes to Jesus. God, my God, I cry out. You've been loving me so now. God, be near. Come, my fear. And take my doubt. Your kindness is what pulls me out. Your love is so Dr. Wesley Knight is the president and co-founder of Communiversity, a nonprofit organization that provides leadership training, ministry consulting, and community empowerment both nationally and internationally. Dr. Knight attended Oakwood University where he received a bachelor's in theology. He earned a master's in divinity with an emphasis in preaching from Andrews University, and he earned a doctor of ministry degree from the McCormick Theological Seminary in Chicago, Illinois. In 2012, Dr. Knight was inducted into the prestigious Martin Luther King Jr. Board of Preachers and Scholars at Morehouse College. He recently served as the Assistant Professor of Preaching and Religion at Oakwood University. Dr. Knight's greatest joy in this world is his family. He is married to his best friend, Stephanie, who works as an occupational therapist and who also serves the Lord through preaching, teaching, and empowering women. They are blessed to have two wonderful children. 
Please welcome Dr. Wesley Knight. His presence. If God's been good to you all this great camp meeting, put your hands together one more time and give him praise. We're grateful to be here tonight as the Lord has been speaking through all of his children this week. And indeed, it's my privilege to come to you all the way from Atlanta, Georgia, to tell you that we serve a risen Savior and he's in the world today. I want to thank the president and the administration for this opportunity to share the gospel tonight as we lift up Jesus, who is soon to return. I'm very, very happy that my wife and children are here with me, Stephanie and Asia and Ajani. We are grateful that the Lord has blessed me to be able to marry my very best friend in life. Amen. And God indeed has a word tonight. I've I've heard that the Spirit has been moving all week long. In fact, I've felt it as I've been on campus, and the Lord has been speaking to us. And we believe because God is able, tonight will be no different. And so if you will allow me to be able to go to God's Word tonight in the interest of time, I want to take us to John chapter 5 as we want to stay on track with this theme of looking up and trusting in God. I want to look at John chapter 5, and I'm going to read in your hearing a few verses there from the English Standard Version, and you could read along silently as I read audibly. Would you join me in standing for the reading of the Word tonight, if you would? John chapter 5, I'll read verses 1 down through 9, and if you're ready, say yes. yes. This is what the Word says. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool in Aramaic called Bethesda, which has five roofed colonnades. In these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been paralyzed or an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time, he said to him, do you want to be healed? The sick man answered him, sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I am going, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, get up, take up your bed and walk. Verse 9 says, and at once... Some versions say immediately. The man was healed, and he took up his bed, and he walked. Tonight, I want to preach to you from the subject, do you really want it? Let's pray. Father, have your way. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You may be seated. Do you really want it? We serve a God who, amongst many things, specializes in restoration. Is that he restores what the enemy has come to corrupt and disrupt. That our God restores the things that time has taken away, that mistakes have taken away. Our God is a restoring God. When Jesus shows up in John chapter 5 at this pool of Bethesda, he is dealing with a man, watch this, who needs restoration because the Bible says that he has been paralyzed for 38 years, but he was not born paralyzed, which means that something happened to him some incident, some accident, some consequence, we learn, of a choice that ends him up paralyzed. Now, this is important to note because he is not born paralyzed. Something happens to him. And Jesus comes to this place to restore 
not only what the man might have uh, had taken away, but the God that we serve is a God who restores things that we've given away. And, and that's important to note because it's not like the devil took something from him. You know, we like to talk about how busy the devil is. And we like to talk about what the devil stole from us and what the devil is coming against and what the devil is doing in our lives. But if we be honest tonight, there are some things he did not take away. There are some things we gave away. We gave away by decisions, by choices that were outside of the will of God. Yet the good news of the gospel is that even if what you've given away, Jesus is able to restore. Can I hear somebody say amen? amen. The Bible says when Jesus comes to this pool, to this place, Solomon's porch, he, he sees that there are five pools in this place and uh, five porches in this place and there is this large pool here in this place called Bethesda. Bethesda meaning the house of mercy. Yet ironically there is no mercy in this house. It was a makeshift hospital. There were no doctors there for this is where desperate people came. They came in order to get their healing because medicine had not worked. And going to the doctors had not worked. And using herbs and spices had not worked. And so having run out of everything they could try, they come to this makeshift hospital called Bethesda. The Bible records that people hang around the five pools because they believed that they could be healed. In fact, your Bible, if you read in the KJV, one of my favorite versions, or the New King James Version, you will see that there is a verse there that I did not read. If you notice that, that was on purpose because this pool, it was rumored that an angel would come down from heaven, and whenever they saw the surface of the water moving, that it was an angel coming down, troubling the water, and whoever got in first got their healing. Now stay with me, for there is a problem with this part of the story. There's a problem because they believed that an angel came down, troubled the water, and if you got in while the surface of the water was bubbling, you could get your healing. They said that the angel only came at a certain time, in a certain way, and that you had to be first in order to be healed. That's a problem because that's not congruent with the way my God works. You mean to tell me that you have to be first in order to get healed? That, that's not congruent with the way my God works because if this were true, then that would mean those who get to church earliest get the better blessings. <laughs> and if that were true, that would mean that those who get to church early might be a little bit more holy than the rest of us. But have you ever bumped into some folks who get to church early? If you dare sit in their seat, <laughs> there may be a problem. Uh, this, this is problematic. The reason why modern versions leave that verse out is because, I want you to catch this, this was an urban myth, a legend that desperate people told themselves. They did not understand that the troubling of the water was not necessarily a supernatural thing. It was actually a natural thing because uh, these pools were, were built upon natural springs. So as the earth's surface would heat up, the, the, the water, the spring water would bubble up to the surface. Watch this. So that if you got into the water early, it would make you feel better, but not necessarily make you better. Now, this is insightful. This is important because what happens is these people are huddled around the pool, putting their hope in the pool, putting their faith in the pool. And God would use the pool every now and again to soothe their pain and to make them feel better and to take the chronic agitation away. But their problem was their faith was in the pool. That's why they stayed there. That's why they huddled around. And may I suggest to you, church, that we have this problem going on in our time, that, that 
that sometimes we put too much faith in the pools God uses. Oh, stay with me. I'm going somewhere. Because we often give the things God uses the credit more than the God who uses them. See, God would use the pool every now and again, but it wasn't the pool that was healing them. It wasn't the pool that was making them feel better. It wasn't the pool that was easing their pain. It was the God that used the pain. Let me come a little bit closer. We often give credit to the things God uses rather than the God who uses them. So, so I've heard people in church, I've been pastoring a while now, about 21 years, I've heard members say, this church saved my life. This message, this, this church saved my life. No, I understand what you mean by that. This church is a great church, and God has raised up this church for such a time as this. But it was not this church that saved your life. It was the God of this church that saved your life. Okay, let me come a little bit closer. Uh, I've heard people say, the health message saved my life. This health message, this vegan and vegetarian diet helped me. Uh, no, it was not your vegetarianism or your veganism that saved your life, that got you out of the illness you were in. It was the God whose healing touch touched you in the midnight hour that gave you your healing. I've heard people talk about our schools and how our schools, our, our Adventist schools saved my children. No, it wasn't our Adventist schools that saved your children. They've got great curriculum there. They've got spirit-filled teachers there. But there are some things that the school can't teach your children. There are some lessons that the atmosphere can't give them. It's the Holy Ghost who's the unseen teacher who taught your children lessons. No Bible teacher at school could ever teach teach them. I want you to understand tonight that God deserves all the praise. God deserves all the glory. God gets all the credit. And do let us never put our trust in the pool more than the God who uses it. If you believe it, say amen. amen. In fact, if I might push this a little bit closer, it might have been the enemy's plan to keep them focused on the pool. Because could it be that the plan of the devil is to get us so satisfied with coming to this pool that we never really run into Jesus? Because some of us like being in spiritual settings, but we're never moved by the Spirit. Some of us are simply satisfied to be in a religious setting because it makes us feel better about ourselves. But how many of you know a whole lot of people in this passage hung around the right place, but they never ran into their Savior? So the Bible says Jesus came in and he sees the man. Can you imagine? He walks through. Just, just picture it. He's navigating his way through the crowd of hopeless, helpless, hapless people. He sees this man over in the corner and he walks towards him. Somehow Jesus knows he has been in this condition a long time. 38 years. 38 years of being carried from point A to point B. 38 years of not being able to walk on his own two legs. 38 years of not being able to leap with joy when he was excited. 38 years confined to that place. And God knows he had been praying. God knows he had been asking God, will you please change my situation? And it's one thing to pray for something for a little while. But it's another thing to pray for something and God makes you wait. Do I have anybody in the building who understands the agony of having to wait on God? I'm not talking about waiting a week. I'm not talking about waiting a month. I'm not even talking about waiting for something you want. I'm talking about waiting for something you need. This man has been waiting for 38 years. It is implied that he is a worshiper of Yahweh. He 
has been calling on God 38 years and now Jesus shows up. 38 years and now here you come to the rescue. 38 years I've been waiting for you to do something and now I, I needed you on year 10. I needed you on year 20. I needed you on year 25. Uh, why now 38 years? I would imagine as Jesus approaches the man, this man does not understand that his help has come for this makeshift hospital has no doctor until Jesus shows up. Jesus shows up and looks at the man and, and the man might have wondered if this man is coming to help me, why has he waited so long? And somebody came to camp meeting tonight wondering why is God taking so long? Why is God taking so long to bring me out of this situation? It is because God has to, watch this, balance the time of your preparation with the time of your deliverance. Oh, I'm going to enjoy that all by myself. <laughs> that that, that God, has to, God has to balance the time of your preparation with the time of your deliverance. What this man did not understand is that 38 years was perfect time for him. Now, he might have wanted to be delivered at year 30, but God knew he needed 38 years. Because if God will bring us out too early, we may not be prepared for what God has for us next. If God leaves us in too long, we might not have enough faith left to believe. Oh, y'all, y'all, you look at me like you don't understand. Let me, let me illustrate. Um, so, so my wife, my, my wife, uh, who's here tonight, uh, was pregnant with our, our, our second child, my son, Ajani, and, and she had a little trouble with her pregnancy, so she had to be on bed rest for, uh, for several weeks and, and, and it, actually a couple of months. And so, God help her, I had to cook. Now, I can't cook at all. I can't cook at all. So she said, baby, I made it real simple for you. You don't have to cook anything. All I need you to do is get the frozen pizza and put it in the oven. I said, okay, I got that. I can do that. So I took the frozen pizza. I put it in the oven. And, you know, with my intelligent self, I said to myself, self, um, if you're really going to hurry up and cook this pizza, turn it all the way up to about 405. So I turn it all the way up to 405, and I shove it in there, and then I go back to watching my show. Now, about 25, 30 minutes later, <laughs> I, I smell something coming from the kitchen. I look towards the kitchen, and I see smoke coming out of the oven. And I run there, and I open it, and now smoke is filling the air. My wife is back in the bedroom on bed rest, and she yells, Wesley! I said, yeah. And she said it in that tone. You know husbands. You know when your wife says it in that tone. She says, Wesley! I said, yeah, baby. She said, did you burn the pizza? I, I, I said, uh, uh, you know that little pause. I said, y yeah. She said, watch this. She said, baby, did you read the instructions? I said, no, why would I need to read the instructions? Anybody can make a pizza. She said, well, obviously not. You burned the pizza. She said, did you read the instructions? I said, no, I didn't read the instructions. And then she started preaching to me from the bedroom. She said, she said, baby, you got to read the instructions. I yelled back, why? She said, because the person who created the pizza knows how long it's supposed to be in the oven. She said, if you pull it out too early, it's not fit for human consumption. If you leave it in there too long, it will burn up. She said, so if you follow the instructions, you put it to the right amount of heat for the right amount of time so that when you pull it out, it's ready to be eaten. I said, oh, I just got a revelation. You see, some of us are asking God to pull us out of the oven too early. And God is saying, if I pulled you out too early, you would give credit to your intelligence. If I pulled you out of that trial too early, you would think it was your ingenuity and your innovation and your degree that got you out. If I pulled you out, I wouldn't get credit for the blessing. If I leave you in there too late, they won't be enough of you to praise me. So how many of you know that God will bring you out of the fire right on time? Do not give up on your God. 
He knows what he's doing. Somebody say yes. So Jesus shows up at 38 years. It's not his timing. It's not the man's timing. It's Jesus' timing. Because the old folks used to say, he may not come when you want him, but he'll be there right on time. And watch what Jesus does. He, 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 he looks at the man. He sees the despair in his eyes. And Jesus asks him a question that seemingly makes no sense. Because they're in a hospital. And he looks at the patient and he says, do you want to be made whole? Uh, really, Jesus? Uh, I've been sick for 38 years. I'm in a hospital. That's a clue that I want to be made whole. I, I want to be healed. Jesus, why would you ask me a question where I'm in a place and in a position to get what it looks like I want, but never passed by the questions of Jesus. For Jesus is never obsessed with the obvious. Oh, preach Holy Ghost. When Jesus asks a question, he asks it not only to get information, really he doesn't because he already knows, he really asks it to reveal to you your true state. So watch what Jesus does. Do you want to be made whole? Jesus asked the question because the man's primary problem was not his legs. It was his will. Jesus asked him, do you want to be made whole? It's not a question of what he can do. It's a question of what he will do. Jesus did not ask the man what he could do. He asked the man what he wanted done for him. Don't miss this. The greatest obstacle between you and your answer to your prayer is your will. It is not the enemy. It is not evil spirits. It's not the people around you. The greatest obstacle to, between you and your prayer request, between you and your God, is not the devil. It is your will. And I ask you tonight, do you really want what you've been praying for? Do you really want what you've been asking for? Now, the first answer to that would obviously be yes. That's why I prayed. But the reason why Jesus asked this question is to reveal that sometimes we put ourselves in a position to look like we want change, but we don't really want it. Huh. You see, because change will only happen when the pain of staying the same is more than the pain of change. When you become so uncomfortable with being comfortable where you are, then you are ready for change. And some of us just like to hang around the pool. Now, in case you miss what I mean by pool, uh, let's just call it the church. Because there are people who love to hang around church, but don't want to transition into being the church. So being in a religious setting makes you feel better. And Jesus says, you come, but you come and leave the same way week after week. He asked the question tonight, do you want to be healed? Do you really want it? Because our prayer requests often are arrested by our own selfishness, our own self-centeredness. Watch this. Some of us aren't really ready for change because we like the, the benefits of being sick. Mm, I didn't hear anybody say amen right there. <laughs> Uh, uh, we, we like the, the benefits of being sick. What do you mean by that, preacher? I mean that we, 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 like, we like for people to kind of uh, see us as a victim.
victim. We, we like for people to give us sympathy and pity because sometimes pity is a good substitute or it feels like a good substitute for love. We like being where we are because we could look religious on Sabbath but be different on Monday. So if we hang around the pool, people will think we're good seven-day Adventist Christians. But God does not look on the outward appearance. How many of you know he looks at the heart and he's asking you tonight, do you really want what you've been praying for? If you're still with me, shout yes. yes. Now when Jesus asked this question, he is going to the heart of the matter because the power of prayer is not what you say. The power of prayer is how bad you want it. That's why it says the fervent prayer. Not the lackadaisical, not the, not the comfortable prayer, not the convenient prayer, not the every now and again prayer. I, I wish I had a church here tonight. I'm talking about the fervent prayer of the righteous. Amen. Because if you don't want it, then he will not force it on you. If you don't have a passion for it, he will not force it on you. This, this man, 38 years in this situation, and Jesus says, do you want to be made whole? Now, look again at the question, for there is something powerful I want you to get tonight. Jesus asked him about his willingness, not his ability. And in the church, we talk about ability, but the power of God is made manifest in our willingness because we don't have the strength to change our situation. He says, do you want to be made well? Don't miss that. Do you want to be made whole? There is a difference between getting something and being made into something. Notice he did not say, do you want to get well? He said, do you want to be made whole? Do you want to be healed? Ah, don't miss it because getting something denotes the main action is done by you. Being made into something is when an action is performed on you. Getting something requires that you make the initial action. But being made into something uh, requires your simple consent. When Jesus says, do you want to be made whole? He is not asking the man about his strength or his ability. He is saying, will you give me permission? Will you sign a heavenly consent form? Will you allow me to do something in you and on you that you cannot do for yourself? Are you willing to be made in his likeness? Are you willing to receive Christ's victory tonight? Are you willing to let him do what only he can do? If you're honest tonight, someone here is saying, well, I don't really have the will. I kind of want to be changed, but there's sometimes I don't want to be changed. But here's the good news Jesus will work with whatever you got left somebody just missed their hallelujah cue right there that Jesus will work with whatever you've got left he says do you want to do you will to do you desire to and somebody here is saying well pastor if I'm honest sometimes I want God to change me sometimes I want God to give me that prayer request and there's sometimes I don't because my flesh has fallen in love with what I don't need. Mm. And sometimes I want it and sometimes I don't. Where there's good news for you because the Bible says, for it is Christ that worketh in you. Both to will, that's the desire, and to do, that's the ability of his good pleasure oh so what that means is is that Christ by his spirit comes into you he gives you the desire you don't have turns around and gives you the strength you don't have so that when you want to do God's will it's not you doing it it's Christ in you 
Now, some of y'all didn't shout on the Bible, so I got to give you some Ellen White. Look at what Ellen White says. She says, you are not able of yourself to bring your purposes and desires and inclinations into submission to the will of God. So watch what she says. But if you are willing to be made willing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you are willing to be made willing. So you're sitting here saying, preacher, he can't work with me because sometimes I want it and sometimes I don't. No, the devil is a liar. The good news of the gospel is if you bring your little bit of will, he'll add to your little bit of will his ultimate and eternal will for you to be changed and saved. This now then under, helps us to understand the righteousness by faith. That it is not me, but it is Christ in me. It's not even my desire. Because the fact that Jesus is in your life is not because you wanted him. It's because he wanted you. And because he wanted you, he kept knocking on your door. And he kept speaking to you in the midnight hour. And he kept whispering to you. And he kept showing you that he loves you. So that one day, your little bit of will joined his eternal will. And now you're sitting at camp meeting. Don't you know you're not here because of your own strength? But you made it by the power and the will of God Almighty. So watch what happens. Jesus says, uh, do you want to be made whole? Do you want to be made well? Do you want me to do something you can't do for yourself? Watch what the man says. He says what we all say at different times in our own way. Jesus says, do you want will to be made whole? Do you desire it? He starts making excuses based on people. Well, I would, Jesus but there's no person to help me to get into the pool when the surface of the water is troubled. Now, Jesus didn't ask him <laughs> if he had help to get to the pool. That wasn't the question. And Jesus didn't ask you uh, if you have enough strength or if you have friends or people to help you become what he called you to be because watch this your future in God is not dependent upon the people around you can I come a little bit closer <laughs> see see there are people who say well I don't go to church anymore because the people there are hypocrites well you're right there's a whole lot of hypocrites in church that's where hypocrites belong You are correct. There are a lot of hypocrites in church. That's where they belong. And by the way, the definition of a hypocrite is somebody who says something and does something different. And if you look long at the definition and then look in the mirror, you will see that you are probably a hypocrite too. And if you're looking for some perfect church, the day you join that church, it will become imperfect because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God but I don't come to church to see hypocrites I come to church to see Jesus and I'm not going to let anybody run me out of God's house I'm not going to let anybody stop me from coming to church because they didn't pray for me I have a heavenly intercessor I have someone who's talking on my behalf. And if you don't pray for me because you spend all your time praying on me, I've got a God who's got me because I didn't come here for you. I came here to see him. The, the man's making excuses. And, and, and please, I don't want to simplify it. I know that people can be mean and nasty in church. I know sometimes we're not the friendliest people. God knows we're not the friendliest people. I know sometimes people say things they should have prayed about before they said. I know you've been hurt by, by weird side eyes and the way people look at you at judgmental stares. But I got some good news for you. If they did not wake you up this morning... 
if they're not preparing heaven for you, then you push past the crowd to see the Jesus who gave his life for you. The man says, they won't help me. They won't pray for me. They won't do what they're supposed to do. Jesus, in a real sense, says, uh, I didn't ask you about that. Do you want to be made whole? Now, the man, in a real sense, says, I can't do this by myself, Jesus. And Jesus says, I know. So take up your bed and walk. Jesus, didn't you hear me? I can't walk. He says, I know. So walk. Uh, Jesus, you, you must not see my legs. The muscles are atrophied. They haven't moved in 38 years. I can't do this by my, I can't get up. He says, I know. So get up. Uh, I, I, I can't, I can't, I can't take up my bed. It's the thing that has defined me and confined me. I can't carry what's carried me. I can't do it. He says, I know, so do it. See, what Jesus is saying is uh, that your ability to do what he asks you to do is not inherent in your strength. It's inherent in his word. All right, let me do it a different way. God does not, watch this, God does not describe what he sees. When God speaks, when Jesus speaks, he does not use descriptive language. He does not describe what he sees. He prescribes what he intends. Oh. Because the God that I serve, the Bible says, stepped into the nothingness of space and spoke the world into existence. So that he does not use descriptive language. When Jesus speaks, he uses creative language. Oh, so that when he speaks, he's not describing what he sees. He's creating what he intends when he speaks. So if he told you you can do it at the word of Jesus, oh, thank you Jesus he is creating a new possibility for you so that you can literally walk on his word he says get up take up your bed and walk I can't do it by myself you were never meant to do it by yourself Adventist take up your bed and walk I can't do it, mama. I can't please God by myself. Who asked you to please God by yourself? It is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Get up and walk. I, I can't be faithful to my wife. I know you can't do that by your own strength, brother. But Jesus says you can. Get up and walk. I know you can't be honest at work. You, you say you got to cheat in order to get ahead. But God says, no, just get up and walk. Because if I tell you to do it, I give you the power to do it. The word goes into his ear. His brain processes the message of Christ. It sends the message down through uh, the, the, the neural system and, and goes down to these atrophied muscles that have not moved. And at that moment, uh, an argument happens in the man's body. The message of Christ is now arguing with the atrophy of the muscle. The muscle says, I hear you, brain. I hear what Jesus is saying, but we haven't moved in 38 years. This is impossible. Sends the message back from the atrophied muscles back up to the brain. But the word of God says, with man, this is, imposs this is impossible. But, 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 but with God, all things are impossible. Sent the message back down to the atrophied muscles, and they're still arguing with the word of Jesus. Don't you understand? We can't get up. We have not gotten up. For, four, for 38 years sends the message back to the brain but the brain under the management of Jesus says we're under new management now and if Jesus says we've got to move then he's given us the power to move and the man gets up on legs he has not stood on for 38 years and the man stands up on the word of God because he didn't do it he was made into something and now he begins to try his brand new legs out. 
I can imagine, it's not there in the text, but I would just imagine that as he is shifting around and trying his new legs, he probably puts one up and tries to see if he can balance. And, and he probably did a little jog and maybe even got real happy and jumped. See, because if God has done something for you, it's hard not to, to try out. It's hard not to display the goodness of God. And the Bible says that he stands up, he takes up his mat, throws it over his shoulder, and walks out of a place he was carried into. Because that's just what Jesus will do for you. Now watch what happens. I'm almost through, but watch what happens. The Bible says that... Uh, He's carrying his mat. And the reason Jesus tells him to do that is his mat is his testimony. Because remember, the mat is what he was carried on. The mat was what he slept on. The mat was his identity. When you saw his mat, you knew his problem. Mm. Jesus says, take up what used to define you. Throw it over your shoulder. And when you walk by, everybody who used to see you as disabled will know that your God is able. Yeah. Wherever you go, you ought to carry your mat with you. You ought to take it to work and say, my God is a prayer answering God. My God is able to do anything but fail me. He's watch, watch this. He's got his mat on his shoulder and he's walking through the temple. But here come the holy hypocrites. Here come the theological police. They're in every church you know. Yeah, the holy FBI. They launch an investigation into what this man is doing because it's the Sabbath. And you shouldn't be doing this on the Sabbath. You should not be carrying this mat on the Sabbath. Might I part here parenthetically to help you understand why not everybody will celebrate your deliverance? That not everybody in church will be happy that you've moved to a new level in Christ? That not everybody throws a party when you get victory? You know why? Think about it. They were used to looking down on him. And there are some people who will not celebrate. Uh, they are so busy being sanctimonious and being so high and mighty and self-righteous that they will not celebrate. Why? Because in church, and you know this is true, there are people who measure their righteousness in comparison to your issues. They're mad now because they were used to looking down on him. Now they have to look at him. And they say, who told you to carry this mat? Who, who, who gave you the right to walk through here healed? Who told you that you could be whole? Who told you that you could walk around like this? And, and watch what happens. The man says, I don't even know his name. Now, now you got to catch what's happening here because this man has been healed. This man has been restored and he doesn't even know the name of the man who did it for him. Mm. That means I don't have to get everything in my life together for God to move in my life because this man didn't even know the name of Jesus. And yet the power of Jesus was made manifest in his life. That's good news for somebody in here. To know that Jesus moves on you even when you don't understand everything about him. There wasn't no 28 fundamental Bible study given. They didn't take them through a Bible study class. But the power of God will move on anybody who is willing to be made willing. So he's walking around healed. I don't know his name. And he says it with a kind of defiance because the people who judge you, let me say it this way, don't ever let anybody stop your praise if they were not part of your deliverance. So, so, so if you get a little excited because what God has done for you and you're sharing your testimony, don't let anybody quench your thirst, quench your desire because if God has done it for you, he deserves the praise. I don't know who he is. Jesus comes around a second time. 
he finds him in the temple healed and restored. And watch what Jesus says. He says, hey, man, you, you got some new legs. God has done something great for you. But watch this. I've come around a second time because it would be a shame for you to have new legs but not a new heart. Because if you go back to the same sins that caused this accident, it'll be a shame that you'll use new legs to go to old places. So don't do this sin that got you in this trouble. Don't do that same thing again. And the man at that moment got Jesus' name. And what I love about it is, the people who previously interrogated him, the man goes and finds them. <laughs> and he says, by the way, you are asking me who did this to me? I didn't know his name before. I don't know much about theology, but I did get his name. I do not know much about psychology, but I do know his name. I don't know much about soteriology, the study of salvation, but I did get his name. I don't know much about pneumatology, the study of the Holy Spirit, but I do know his name. I don't know much about eschatology, the study of last day things, but I did get his name. And all I need is his name because in that name is power. In that name is strength. Do I have a church here tonight? In that name is salvation. The righteous run in it, into it and they are saved. I know his name. His name is Jesus. Does anybody know that name tonight? It's the name above every name. It's the name we call in trouble. It's the name that God has given us that when we are in the midnight hour, we call on his name. Jesus, Jesus, and salvation comes. The question is, do you really want it? Amen. Because he does. Amen. Do you want to be made whole? Amen. He wants you to be made whole. Amen. Do you want to be changed? He wants to change you. Do you want God to do the impossible in your life? All you've got to do is give him the little bit of will you have left. You say, Pastor, I don't, I don't have a whole lot of will left because life has beaten me up. I've been disappointed a whole lot of times. I I've tried. I've actually come to the altar, surrendered it, then picked it up and took it back with me. I, 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 I kind of want it, but sometimes I don't. That's okay. Because grace... Grace says that Jesus has more patience with you than you have with yourself. And maybe tonight is your 38 years. Maybe your time is up of waiting. Maybe tonight, if you will just give him the little bit of will you got left, Jesus will change your situation. But ultimately, he'll change your heart. Because the will of God is not simply to make you better. The will of God is to make you new. And if you're here tonight and you're saying, Pastor, I really want it, but my will sometimes wanes under the strain of life and I need him to help me, I'm willing to be made willing. If that's you tonight, I want you to stand to your feet. I want to pray for you. I want to pray that the will of God be made manifest in your life, willing to be made willing. As your heads are bowed, your eyes are closed, I want to say this in the power of and the authority of Jesus Christ tonight. Wherever you are lame in your life, the power of Christ is here tonight to make you walk in that same area. 
wherever you are weak in some area of your life, the power of God is here tonight to make you strong in that same area. It will not be your strength. It will not be your effort. It will not be your hard work. It will be the power of Christ in you. The reason why some of you aren't happy is because you're tired of working too hard. Trying to make yourself what God called you to be. Stop working and st stop working and start trusting that the work Jesus did on Calvary is completing in you. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for these who are standing all over this building tonight, signifying that they really want what they've been praying for. They want to be like you. They want to be made in the perfect image of Christ. They want to love like you. They want to serve like you. They want to live like you. They want to love like you. Jesus, I pray that you will take their little bit of will, take our little bit of will, and make us what you've called us to be. We believe tonight that you're able. We confess tonight that we're willing. Have your way. In Jesus' name, amen. Put your hands together and praise God tonight. Oh, what a powerful, 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 powerful sermon. We've been listening to Wesley Knight, who's been talking to us about Jesus using our will and making us willing to be willing. Yeah, that and uh, <clears throat> many powerful points that he brought out as far as, you know, God doesn't want to just give us new legs or make us better. He wants to make us new and give us a, a new heart. Um, and then also uh, the fact that God, when we're in the fire, uh, he will not take us out too early and he doesn't want to take us out too late. Yeah. But God comes in right on time. <laughs> I and, liked his illustration yeah. of the pizza exactly. that he burnt. I don't know if I've ever burned a pizza before, but maybe. In my time. <laughs> but the other amazing point also is the fact that, uh, you know, where he mentions that the man didn't even know the name of Jesus. And no. Think about how many people out there who are being moved upon by God. Had you ever thought never, of that before? He didn't even know not exactly Jesus in that way. name. No. And yet he trusted him enough to pick up his bed mm -hmm. and walk. And then the other point that uh, Pastor Knight brought out that I hadn't thought of before was his mat, was his testimony. Yeah. That was his testimony to say, I was freed from this mat. And he had been on that mat for 37 years. Yeah, he carried that which carried him. Yes. Yeah. Powerful, powerful, powerful. It was. Now, we want to encourage uh, you know, folks at home also to be thinking about their evangelism offering. Yes. To be praying about how much they want to give to support the offering, which- super easy. Extremely, extremely simple and very easy. Camp, uh, watchcampmeeting.com. They can go to watchcampmeeting.com. And there's a button there that just simply says give. Give. And just click, like that. pray, click, and give. But we want them to pray about the amount that God is asking them to pray about. Uh, to take it seriously. It's a sacrificial gift. It goes all toward evangelism, Glow, Souls West, uh, cross trainers, Bible workers, evangelism, uh, retreats for, for people getting to know God, prayer retreats. And it, there's a plethora of, of, of lines, line item, budget items that this goes to. So yeah. it's a sacrificial gift. We want them to take it seriously. Definitely. So join us tomorrow morning for Sabbath school, Wesley night again for church and that evening. And we always want to remind you, keep looking up.